This week at VMware's VMworld 2019 conference in San Francisco, VMware announced it's working on a project called Pacific. Now, it would rebuild its vSphere virtualization platform around the Kubernetes container orchestration platform. So Scott Fulton, fortunately, is here to break this down for us. Uh, Scott, let's talk about this here, get started. Uh, what, what are we really reading about here? It, it kind of sounds on paper like, well, company A is, is making platform B to work with platform C, so people can do X on Y. Right. And you read over that and you think, oh, my eyes glaze over. You, you, you need to put a pair of glasses on to figure out what's going on. And, and what's happening here actually is there is a fundamental layer of networking in people's enterprises that's about to be infused with one of the major factors that makes distributed computing happen, which makes things happen like you watching me right now, uh, the, the service that makes video happen. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of an implanting of a, a, a new type of platform that's centered around workloads on top of an old platform that's centered around machines. You, you've probably seen, if you read some of my stories in ZDNet, if you're among the dozens of people who read me, uh, you see that I use a lot of maps. And networking is about mapping, is about trying to find a location for the things that you want to have done. Mapping, typically in networking, for the last 25, 30 years, has been about finding the right machine, finding the address for the machine, and finding the route to get there. What's happening in networking is a moving of mapping from machines to workloads, to the things that actually happen. So what do I want to do right now? Let's find the route in the network that takes me there. And this is what VMware has struggled with trying to implement for you know, the, the last few decades. VMware is essentially the corporation that pioneered virtualization in the, uh, in the enterprise, in the workspace. Virtualization being the, the, the capability to, to, to build uh, virtual machines or, or units of functionality and move those units of functionality around the network. Without virtualization, we couldn't be doing what we're doing now. Uh, so, so what's happening here is um, Kubernetes is a, a very, unique and well-meaning type of, of workload orchestration, uh, a way of, of implanting workloads on networks rather than machines on networks. Uh, and having to coexist, have, and to have that, that old system that VMware has already had, that people already rely on for two decades or more, to coexist with this new system that is so much more efficient uh, and, and it plants an idea that some people said is actually insipid. It, it just, it, it's like a virus once it goes through. Uh, making those two systems coexist and still being able to make money off of it is something that VMware has had a little bit of difficulty figuring out how it's going to be able to do. But this might be it. You're looking at a frame from a YouTube video and you'll find it online if you look up a uh, uh, VMworld 2019 general sessions, you'll see what's going on back here. This was Monday's introduction of Project Pacific. And it's a remapping of vSphere, which a lot of people will know because it's, it's in their enterprise now, but it places Kubernetes in not one, but two locations. One is here at the foundational level at where the network is defined, uh, at where the hypervisor layer is defined. The hypervisor becomes a distributed platform. And then the second place is up here at the user application level. So what people do with their applications in the data center will be living right alongside the old style virtual machines. Um, this is a project that could take several years to actually complete. However, when it happens, it could change the way that enterprises deliver applications to you. So, and by, by change the way, is it something you can actually feel? Yeah, because if you, if you could get an app on your phone, you didn't have to go through an app store, you didn't have to go through a search engine, you could just simply ask the voice system to bring me the functionality that does this, and there it is, that would change the way that you do your business. 
All right, and, and you touched on this, but expand for us here, Scott, a little bit on, uh, you know, vSphere, what it is, what is Kubernetes, and, you know, why do you think uh, the people there in Glass Towers, uh, why should they care? Why should they use both, maybe? vSphere uh, is the platform. When, when I say platform, I'm talking about a digital program that supports other digital services. It supports them. It's why we have things that are that on the architectural level are, are represented in layers. vSphere is the platform for most of the world's enterprise workloads. There really isn't a commercial platform that comes close to that. There is an open source platform that tries to do things a different way, and people might have heard of OpenStack. And VMware has actually tried to integrate OpenStack in some of its alternative products. But, but vSphere is, is this ecosystem of, of things that, that of virtual entities that exist on a remapped network in this type of virtuous cycle. That's why I call it an ecosystem. And, and a great majority of the world's enterprises are using this right now, and they don't even know it. They might, they might have actually heard the word for the first time, but what they did is they invested in virtualization from VMware 15, 20 years ago. It became vSphere, and they've got it. Now, what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is an open source platform for orchestrating workloads, for taking the little containers that make things happen in a data center and moving them to where they need to be so that they have the memory and the database and the connectivity that they need to do their work. And also being able to split them apart, duplicate them, make as many copies as necessary when the demand on that workload increases and to reduce them when the demand decreases. So it's scalable. And Kubernetes have worked far, far better than anything else tried in this department in the past. So that's why it has been so rapidly adopted in the last few years. But it came out of Google. Uh, when it came out of Google, it was not a Google product. It was an open source product. And now it is managed by a department of the Linux Foundation called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, and that project includes Google, but it also includes Microsoft, and it includes VMware. They all have engineers that, that, uh, that contribute to the project. Matter of fact, the, the man in white standing right there is one of them. So what's going to happen here is a kind of rethinking of the way that enterprises decide how to deliver their services to customers. Are they gonna be using a VMware model? Are they gonna be using a Microsoft model? Are they gonna be using a Red Hat IBM model? There's going to be a lot of choice here and the choice has to do with, with strange architectural nuances that we're all going to have to learn about if we're going to be able to get by providing services to customers. And Scott, what do you think, what, what will this really change? You know, it, and is this something that's changed, something that you and I can really feel? Yeah, I'll give you one principal example. Right now in watching me, you, the viewer, are using the web. The web is an application on top of the internet. And the way the web is organized right now, it's structured uh, around a concept called the domain name service. It's what gives a name to the site you're using. ZDNet.com is a domain name. And whenever you type that into a browser, the domain name service someplace on the internet says, okay, I recognize this, I think, but I'm gonna attach a numeric IP address to that. And that'll tell me what machine that, that uh, person's going to use. And that machine maps to something called a gateway. And the gateway leads to a number of various computers that all have different addresses. Uh, and it's going to choose the best one for you to be able to see the video you're watching and read the content that you read. That's how the web works today. Well, if we change things like this, we're going to have a concept that, that comes into play called the service mesh. And what we mean by service mesh is uh, imagine services that advertise themselves by name. I am the video provider. I am the text provider. Um, it, it's not by, by a numeric address, but, but he, uh, here's my manifest, here's what I am, and here's what I do. It's like looking something up in the yellow pages that's a lot more informative than the yellow pages used to be. And uh, what that would do is make functionality somewhat different. 
So if I were at a voice assistant and I were to say to the voice assistant, computer, tell me more about what happened at VMworld, instead of looking at a search engine and saying, and pulling up ZDNet and some of its competition and saying, well, here's, here's a variety of videos on the subject and, and here's an odd looking guy uh, with a cat on his, his, um, his, his TV behind him to explain what it all means. What it could actually do instead is, is go through the service mesh and look through um, a, a, a different set of providers and say, here's somebody you've trusted before, and we're going to bring you the video on that now. That, it changes how you find and locate things. In a world with a service mesh, that, and service meshes are tied directly to Kubernetes, what happens is you don't need a search engine the way you used to. So you're Googling things less than you did, or, or you're using fewer search engines, or the three people who use Bing are binging things less than they did. And, and then also, the way you get an app on your phone, on your device, on your tablet, right now you have to go through an app store, you know, a Google Play store, or you, you go underground, you get, you get something from one, one of these Taiwanese gray market uh, locations. But, if you, but that's all kind of controlled by the centralized entity. In a world that is completely mapped by a service mesh, the app could install itself when you ask for something to be done. You don't have to ask for the app, you ask for the service. And the service mesh says, well, I know what app does that. And it implants the thing on your phone. You say, you want this? You say yes. Or you say, no, I don't trust it. Well, if you say yes, then it, it'll bring up a, a video and hopefully it's somebody like me. Maybe it's somebody better looking than I am and it'll explain uh, what, what's going on. So it's more responsive to you. This is one way things could change that you actually see and feel. Well, Scott, we hope your videos are getting uh, pulled up regularly as you have a real knack for breaking down uh, difficult things and, and making it a little bit easier to understand. So we appreciate that. Well, I have friends who tell me I have a real knack for breaking down, so I, I appreciate that too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Always a pleasure to have you with us, Scott. If you'd like to learn more, uh, you can read Scott's full article and much more on VMware's uh, World 2019 Conference from San Francisco. Thanks for watching us here on ZDNet.